Huh. We got a lot more subscribers lately. Wonder why that is. Oh wow! This video has seriously blown up! Over 55,000 views? That's amazing! I should rewatch it! As well as the previous videos about this very same subject. I will also include a link to the chart I made for this video in the description for you to use. And finally... Hey guys, it's Maka, and I welcome you to the brand new What Is and Isn't Shin Megami Tensei video, version 2.0. Now, I'm gonna make this clear. I don't think my original video is bad. Well, I do, but only because I've improved a lot since then. The reason I want to redo it is because there are a number of inaccuracies and issues I have with it. Some of the biggest being that my sources weren't as solid as I once thought, and I wasn't exactly clear about a lot of what I said. I, to this day, am still getting comments on that video from people who are confused about all of it. Now with SMT5's release looming ever closer, I didn't want to be the guy who continued to confuse and spread misinformation just as the series started growing in popularity. And in order to do that, I have to start with a simple question. What is a Shin Megami Tensei game? And what isn't? And to act as a surrogate for you, the viewer, so I have someone to yell all of this at, is my friend Owen! What the hell? What the fuck? Ass? Where am I? But before we answer that question, we need to go over what the hell the franchise really is. While in the West, it's called Shin Megami Tensei, in Japan, it goes under a different name. Megami Tensei. Wait, it's just a one word difference? Why does that matter? Shut up, I'm talking. In 1987, the video game developer Atlas, then known for making license tiles for the NES, made a video game adaptation of author Ayane Shitani's book, Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei. Despite sharing the same name, Atlas's Megami Tensei was actually a sequel that took place after the first and second novels, making it an alternative version of the third book. The game was considered revolutionary for its time due to its standout feature, demon negotiations. Rather than having a party of defined characters, your party was made up of the two main characters from the book, Akemi Nakajima and Yumiko Shirasagi, and four demons. You obtain these demons by talking to them and convincing them to join your side. As you progress into the game and get stronger, you're even able to fuse these demons into new, more powerful ones. You see, in the original novel, Nakajima, who is the very definition of an edgelord by the way, creates a demon summoning program in order to seek revenge against those that have wronged him. How'd he make this program? Well, he's just that goddamn smart, that's how! He's so cool, and smart, and all the girls want him, and he has a flaming samurai sword, and he beats up the bullies that bullied him because they deserve it for what they did to me! How dare they cross me like that! They're just a bunch of stupid Chads and Stacys! I'm a fucking god compared to them! No! No, I'm so much better than a god! I make the gods do my bidding! I'll make them pay. I'll make them all pay! <laughs> <laughs> uh, mm, sorry about that. Using this program, Nakajima is able to summon various demons and have them do his bidding. While his power trip eventually comes back to bite him in the ass when the demon Loki stops obeying and tries to kill Yumiko Shirasagi, also known as the titular Magami Tensei, or reincarnation of the goddess Izanami, Nakajima is able to use the demon summoning program to fight back against the evils he confronts. By taking this concept and turning it into a gameplay mechanic, Atlas had effectively created the first mainstream monster collecting game almost a decade before Pokemon even existed. Following the success of the first game, Atlas made a sequel also for the Famicom called Digital Devil Story Megami Tensei 2 in 1990. Taking place in the year 2036, the world has been demolished through nuclear war, forcing the survivors to live in shelters. The game opens with two friends playing a game called Devil Busters. After being the first boss, they unseal Pazuzu, a demon claiming to be a servant of God. He tells the pair that they are messiahs destined to save the world, and he gives them the demon summoning program. From there, the game spirals into a war between the forces of heaven and hell, with the protagonist recruiting various demons, swapping sides throughout, teaming up with a heroine to fight for humanity, and becoming enemies with his friend and fellow messiah. In 1995, both this game and the first would be remade for the SNES in a compilation called Kyuyaku Megami Tensei. But the question needs to be asked. Outside of the demon summoning program and having the same basic gameplay, 
What exactly makes this a sequel to the first one? Well, you remember that Devil Busters game that the protagonist and his friend were playing in the beginning? Yeah, apparently Nakajima made that. So knowing all of this, I have another question to ask you. Why do you think Megami Tensei 2 had so little connection to the first? Do you think they were happy just making licensed titles based on a book series that, in all honesty, was likely going to lose relevance as time went on? Does the sequel feel like the team at Atlas had ambitions far beyond what Aya Nishitani's writing would allow? Megami Tensei 2 covered themes such as modern day religion, betrayal, humanity, nuclear weaponry, morality, and God, almost none of which were explored in the original Digital Devil story novel. This small team of developers was outgrowing Megami Tensei. They wanted to make a game that they could call theirs, one that would act as a reimagining of what they were trying to accomplish with Megami Tensei 2. An apocalyptic world created from nuclear warfare. One where you fight to save humanity from the forces of heaven and hell. A task that requires you to make and break ties with various people throughout. All of this while recruiting various mythological creatures to your side. However, one additional gameplay mechanic would be added to the mix, leading to what would become this game's defining characteristic. The ability to align yourself with one of three sides based on choices made throughout. Depending on your actions, you could end up aligning yourself with law, an ideology defined by the desire for peace, security, and order. By siding with law, you would be siding with the Judeo-Christian God and his servants, allowing the world to live in harmony at the cost of their free will. On the other end of the spectrum, you could end up aligning yourself with chaos, an ideology defined by complete and utter free will. By siding with chaos, you would be siding with Lucifer and the forces of hell, allowing both human and demon to roam free and do as they wish so long as they have the strength to do so. But law and chaos wouldn't be the only alignment. A third one, one of neutrality, could be chosen if the player balanced their choices between the two extremes leading to the rejection of gods and demons in favor of letting humanity rebuild and be reborn. In many ways, this game would be the antithesis of its contemporary RPGs. It would be darker both in plot and imagery. It would draw inspiration from various post-apocalyptic and dark fantasy manga such as Devil Man, Fist of the North Star, and Violence Jack. It would take place in a contemporary setting, allowing for an experience that hit closer to home for Japanese players. Much like how the original Megami Tensei brought many new elements into the world of JRPGs in 1987, this game was set to introduce even more new elements. There really was only one way to describe this game. New. Or true. Shin can be translated in a few different ways. In 1992, Atlas released Shin Megami Tensei for the Super Famicom. Releasing to a very positive reaction in sales, the game helped better establish Atlas as both a developer and as a publisher. Though it had problems that both fans and even the team behind the game acknowledged, the game would go on to spawn multiple sequels and ports. Shin Megami Tensei 1 would eventually release outside of Japan via an iOS port of the Game Boy Advance version, though the app no longer works as of iOS 11. In 1994, Shin Megami Tensei II continued the story and world of the first game 50 years later, while Shin Megami Tensei IF marked the first non-numbered title. Wanting to make a game with a smaller scope than the last two, IF takes place in a world where the apocalypse never happened, and instead deals with the protagonist's high school being transported to the Expanse, the world in which demons come from in every SMT game. Alongside the standard demon summoning mechanic, the guardian system was added, which allowed players to summon a guardian angel of sorts upon their death. The next game in the series wouldn't come until December 2002 with Shin Megami Tensei 9. Named after the game's nine alignments, it released on the original Xbox and was considered a commercial failure. Though despite this, it still sold well enough to be in the Xbox Platinum Collection. Just in case you wanted an idea of how dead on arrival the Xbox was in Japan. Originally envisioned as an online game, it was split into single player and online versions. However, due to the failure of the single player release, the online version was cancelled. 
Unlike every other entry in the mainline series, 9 is the only game to not have a full translation of any kind, whether official or fan translated. Following the failure of 9 came Shimigami Tensei 3 Nocturne, the third proper entry in the mainline series. Releasing in 2003 on the PlayStation 2, this entry attempted to change up the formula of SMT by setting it within a more creative apocalyptic setting and replacing the alignment system with reasons, a system that focuses more on ideologies that do not necessarily fit within the law chaos dichotomy. For instance, the Shijimo reason is about collectivism and the eradication of the individual while the Musubi reason is based on isolation and the self as absolute. The game would also create what is now the standard combat system within the grander franchise, the press turn system. By taking advantage of an enemy's weakness, you can gain upwards of 8 actions per turn, as well as lose them. However, you aren't the only one able to take advantage of this system, as every enemy you face is just as easily able to make use of it. Nocturne would be the first mainline SMT game to release outside of Japan and receive three versions. The base release, the Maniacs Edition, which is what released outside of Japan and features a new ending, new dungeon, and Dante from the Devil May Cry series, and the Maniacs Chronicle Edition, which replaces Dante with Raido Kuzunoha the 14th. Who is Raido Kuzunoha? Don't worry, stick a pin in that, because we'll be coming back to him later. After Nocturne, the series would return to non-numbered entries with Shin Megami Tensei Imagine in 2007 and Strange Journey in 2009. Imagine was an MMO that had evolved out of the online version of SMT9. After the single player release failed, the game was cancelled and plans were reworked into what would become Imagine. After running for 7 years, the service was officially shut down in 2014, though there are still fan servers available if you want to play. As for Strange Journey, it was released in 2009 for the Nintendo DS and acted as a return to the classic first-person dungeon crawling of SMT 1, 2, and IF, while also returning to the classic alignment system of Law and Chaos. Having a large focus on the story, the game takes place with a mysterious black hole called the Swartzvelt that appears in the South Pole and starts expanding. The game follows a group of soldiers as they investigate the Swartzvelt and try to prevent the oncoming apocalypse. This game would be given an enhanced port with the release of Strange Journey Redux on the Nintendo 3DS. This version included three new endings, a brand new dungeon, and various other changes such as a complete downgrade of an art style. In 2013, after nine years, we would finally see a new numbered entry in the form of Shin Megami Tensei 4 for the Nintendo 3DS. Combining the classic alignment system with press turn combat, as well as having the biggest focus on plot of any mainline game yet, SMT4 received rave reviews and would go on to be the best selling entry in the series. While initially planned to have a second version released with new content, that version eventually expanded into 2016's Shin Megami Tensei 4 Apocalypse. Acting as a what if scenario based around 4's neutral ending, the game breaks off and becomes its own story that expands upon the foundation 4 created. This game, while not as lauded as its predecessor, nor as commercially successful, was still very well reviewed and was noted to have very strong first week sales in Japan. Though many fans criticize the game for its story, characters, and tone, it is considered by many to be the best playing game in the series. Finally, we come to Shin Megami Tensei 5, which is set for release in 2021. Taking influence from both Nocturne and 4, 5 is set to be both the return to home consoles for the series, as well as the series debut on HD systems. While not much is known about the game, series producer Kazuyuki Yamai has reassured fans that it will be well worth the wait. So there we have it! Those are the Shin Megami Tensei games. Uh, but wait, what about Persona? If those aren't Shin Megami Tensei games, then why do they have the name on the box? And what about these other games, like Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner Ra Redu Kuzukano vs. The Soulless Army? Oh, yeah, those. Um... I guess the best place to start is to clarify that everything I've been talking about since I brought up SMT1 is considered mainline SMT. What makes them stand apart from the rest of the games is the fact that they are turn-based dungeon crawlers with a focus on multiple endings tied to various ideologies. They themselves are an evolution on Megami Tensei, so if we had to make a comparison, think of it like Mario Bros to Super Mario Bros. 
There's the Megami Tensei series and the Shin Megami Tensei series, both of which are a part of the Megami Tensei franchise that, depending on where you live in the world, is called the Shin Megami Tensei franchise. We're only two series in and it's already confusing. How many series are in this franchise? Ten. What the fu- Let's jump back to 1992. The same year the first Shin Megami Tensei title released was also the debut of the first spin-off game, which made its home on the Nintendo Game Boy. This game was called Last Bible, and it was a much more conventional RPG for its time. The game makes use of an overhead view instead of a first person one, takes place in a medieval world, and has an overall lighter tone. The demons aren't even called demons in this game, instead opting for the name Monsters. This game would go on to spawn five main entries and three mobile games. However, only the first game would ever be brought overseas, being localized as Revelations the Demon Slayer for the Game Boy Color. While Last Bible 2 and Another Bible would release on the original Game Boy like the first game, Last Bible 3 released on the SNES and would be the only console entry in the series. There was also a Game Gear exclusive game called Last Bible Special that, while still featuring a lighter tone and medieval setting, returned to the first person exploration of the rest of the series. As for Another Bible, it was released on the Game Boy like the first two entries, though it was actually a tactical RPG that took more cues from Majin Tensei. Now Majin Tensei would be the second spin-off series and is much more akin to Mainline than Last Bible ever was. Taking place in a post-apocalyptic setting, what makes Majin Tensei stand out is its gameplay. You see, Majin Tensei is actually a tactical RPG, or strategy RPG if you want to call it that, akin to Fire Emblem. It's also one of the smaller series as it only has three main games, two mobile games, and a manga adaptation. Of course, there's Majin Tensei, which released in 1994 for the SNES, but then there's also Majin Tensei 2, also for the SNES, and Rond, or Ronde, or I don't know how to say this stupid name, this game's bad. It released for the Sega Saturn. Fun fact about Rond, the game was so bad, it is rumored that the demo caused widespread increase in pre-order cancellations. It would also be the last game in the series that wasn't the two mobile games I mentioned. Take a guess why Atlas decided to abandon it. Thus far, there has only been one series I've covered that you'll be hearing people talk about in regular online discourse. You might every once in a while see someone mention Majin Tensei or talk about Megami Tensei, but they're not exactly common. It doesn't help that out of Last Bible, Majin Tensei, and Megami Tensei, only one of the games was ever localized. So you know what? Let's talk about something you'll see more regular online discourse for. In 1995, Atlas would release Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner for the Sega Saturn. Devil Summoner as a series is interesting, as it's kind of split into two sub-series of its own, though not literally. The first two games, Shin Megami Tensei Devil Summoner and Devil Summoner Soul Hackers, deal with occult happenings in a contemporary yet technologically advanced setting, with major cyberpunk influences, especially in Soul Hackers. The latter two games, Devil Summoner Raido Kuzunoha vs. the Soulless Army, and Devil Summoner Raido Kuzunoha vs. King Abaddon, take place in Taisho-era Japan in the 1920s and 30s. In it, you play as Raido Kuzunoha XIV as he tries to protect the capital, TM. While the former are turn-based RPGs in classic SMT fashion, the Raido games are action RPGs. However, what ultimately connects the two halves of this series is their focus on hard-boiled detective mysteries and the Kuzunoha clan. Going more into depth on the specific entries, Devil Summoner 1 was so successful that it actually got a live-action TV drama that adapted the plot of the game, made use of the finest CGI demons, and was so popular it got a second season featuring an original plot. It's also, sadly, the only Devil Summoner game to never be localized, though there is evidence of an attempt. Raido Kuzunoha vs. the Soulless Army would release in 2006 for the PS2, while its sequel, Raido Kuzunoha vs. King Abaddon, would release in 2008, also for the PS2. And if you couldn't make the connection, Raido Kuzunoha is the guy replacing Dante in the base version of Nocturne HD Remaster. The reason for this is when King Abaddon released in Japan, it came with a new version of Nocturne called Nocturne Maniacs Chronicle Edition. In this version, Dante is replaced with Raido. Nocturne HD is going to be using the Chronicle version as a base, though you can still get Dante as DLC. Finally, Devil Summoner Soul Hackers would release in 1997 on the Sega Saturn, though we wouldn't get it in the West until a Nintendo 3DS port in 2013. 
If you play Digimon Story Cyber Sleuth, you have literally played this game. Wait, Digimon? Digital monsters? How is that relevant? It's not, and I don't care. I'm talking about this because I swear to God, no one talks about how the first 10 chapters of Cyber Sleuth are ripped straight from Soul Hackers. You live in a city, enhanced and connected through the use of a virtual world. In this virtual space, strange creatures start appearing that people assume are just strange programs, but are actually creatures from another world. People start recruiting these creatures for their own means, and their origin in this virtual world lies with some seriously shady shit going on with things I don't want to spoil. There's a character you have to fight that is based on rock and roll archetypes. There are so many similarities between these two plots, and I don't want to stray too far into this topic, but it's something I seriously need more people talking about, because people keep saying this game is Digimon Cross Persona, when it has infinitely more in common with Devil Summoner. But you know what? I bet you're wanting to get to the real meat of this video. The part of the franchise you actually give a shit about. It's a legendary series that I bet all of you watching this right now have played or have at least heard of that has led you to want to learn more about this franchise. Hell, I bet some of you are even thinking to yourself, who fucking cares about these other games? Just get to the part about the thing I like. These other games aren't relevant and haven't been for decades. Get to the shit people actually care about. Well, don't worry, because we're finally there. We finally get to talk about it. Jesus Christ, it's so bright! In 1995, Jack Bros released for the Virtual Boy. Not only is this game the first game in the entire franchise to ever be released outside of Japan, but it is objectively the pinnacle of it all. No game has ever come close to this masterpiece, and it is unironically considered one of, if not the best game on the system. I'm not kidding about that last part. Starring Jack Frost, Pyrojack, and Jack Ripper, the game is the ultimate cult classic within the fandom. Jack Bros is Atlas literally sealing Yahweh within a game cartridge. This game would go on to start the smallest series within the franchise, known as the Jack series. The only other official game in the series is a mobile phone game called Jack's Quest Demonic Help Party. However, you can make an argument that the game Shin Megami Tensei Synchronicity Prologue is an entry into the series due to its starring Jack Frost and Pyrojack, though no Jack the Ripper. He was planned to be playable though. But that's not Persona. What? You know what? Fine. We'll talk about Persona all you want. Fuck Jack Bros, am I right? I think you're taking this way too hard, man. YOU'RE TAKING IT TOO HARD! So let's run this back a bit. Remember how Shin Megami Tensei If took place in a high school? Well, the setting was actually pretty well received at the time. As a result, they decided to create a new game that took the spirit of If further. That spirit being the focus on the struggles of young adults and the various issues they deal with. But, you know, with an occult slant to it. If you have ever been a young adult in the modern day, you know that one of the biggest issues teenagers deal with is mental health. This acknowledgement of such a widespread issue led to the game having a thematic focus on Jungian psychology. The Guardian system from IF would also make a return, but it wouldn't be in the way it was originally. Rather, it led to the creation of a new system, one that drew directly from the game's Jungian influences. Megami Ibon Roku Persona would release in Japan in 1996, with a Western localization following shortly thereafter. The game was very, very popular in Japan, and it instantly kickstarted what is now the largest series within the Megami Tensei franchise. Not only are there six main entries within the Persona series, but you also have nine side games, seven enhanced re-releases of every numbered title, four anime TV adaptations, four movies adapting Persona 3, an OVA tie-in for Persona 5, nine stage plays, ten novels, thirteen manga series, a bunch of mobile games people do not care about, and a metric buttfuck of soundtrack and drama CDs. Easily the most popular series within the franchise, 
Persona remains a beloved series that has led to contention among the fanbase for multiple reasons. If you're watching this video, I'm willing to bet that you've either played one of these games or have at least heard of them. I'm also willing to bet that most of you have only played or heard of Persona 3, 4, and or 5. Much like how Devil Summoner can be split into the Raido games and the not Raido games, Persona can be split into two sections, the Tadashi games and the Hashino games. This first set of games are named after Satomi Tadashi. Tadashi was the writer behind the original three Persona games, Persona 1, Persona 2 Innocent Sin, and Persona 2 Eternal Punishment. These games are more akin to mainline as they have a darker tone and put the gameplay focus squarely on the dungeon crawling. The Hashino games, on the other hand, are named after their director, Katsura Hashino. Hashino would direct Persona 3, 4, and 5, with these games having no involvement from Tadashi. These games branched off from the rest of Megami Tensei greatly by putting way more emphasis on style and balancing dungeon crawling with dating sim elements. While Persona 3 does have a darker tone more akin to the Tadashi games, P4 and P5 are much more lighthearted comparatively. While the divide between the Hashino games and the Tadashi games and the rest of this franchise can be talked about at length, this video really isn't the time or place for it. But it is the time and place for you to go on your Digimon rant? If you don't stop your whining, I'm going to- Alright, I get it. Fine. Keep going. Okay, so I want you to set your mind back to the year 2000. Pokemon had just come out and was literally the most popular thing of all time. As a result of its popularity, the market ended up being flooded with companies trying to get their hands on the actual mountains of money Pokemon was generating. As I had mentioned before, Atlas had essentially created the first popular monster collecting game back with Megami Tensei 1 on the Famicom. So for people in Japan at least, Pokemon wasn't exactly a 100% new concept. And of course, Atlas knew this. So, much like every other company at the time, they threw their hat into the ring with Devil Children Black Book and Red Book. No, 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 no. Do not call Devil Children a Pokemon ripoff! LaRue, you know it and I know it. It's obvious and blatant and you just need to accept it for what it is. But Devil Children actually does cool stuff. Each version is actually different. <laughs> different alignments. <laughs> and <laughs> there, there, it's okay. It's okay. Um. Devil Children Black and Red Book were actually fairly successful in Japan, leading to the creation of the Devil Children series. Much like Pokemon, Devil Children had a dual release setup. Black Book and Red Book initially released on the Game Boy Color, but were later merged together in a PS1 remake. The games also received a direct sequel in the form of White Book. These three games would make up the first generation of Devil Children, and even received an anime called Devil Chill. In case you were wondering where all the gifts of Jack Frost came from. Following the first generation, Devil Children Light Book and Dark Book were released for the Game Boy Advance. These games would be the only entries in the series to be brought to the West, being localized as Demi Kids Light Version and Dark Version. These two games would make up the second generation of Devil Children. Finally, there was the third generation, made up of Devil Children Fire Book and Ice Book, also released for the GBA. These two games make up the third and final generation in the series. Outside of a few side games for the GBA and a second anime tie-in, the series has been dormant since 2011 with the release of Devil Children Mobile. So one thing that has become increasingly prevalent as I'm researching Megami Tensei is that with almost every series started since Devil Summoner, Atlas has wanted it to be a more accessible version of the mainline games. This brings us to Atlas's fourth new series in a row that was made with this intention, Digital Devil Saga Avatar Tuner, or as it's known outside of Japan, Digital Devil Saga. Despite only having two entries in the series, Digital Devil Saga remains one of the major temple entries within the Western fanbase. What makes these two games unique is not as simple and easy an explanation as every other series. Digital Devil Saga takes place within a world called the Junkyard. Within the Junkyard are six tribes that are at constant war over land. Following an incident at the border between two tribes, every inhabitant of the Junkyard gains the ability to transform into demonic creatures. 
However, accompanying this transformation are extreme mood swings and an insatiable desire to eat human flesh. The hungrier you get, the more likely you are to give into your demonic tendencies. The tribes then start fighting over the right to ascend the Karma Temple Tower at the middle of the junkyard. They also fight over the girl at the center of the demonic curse, Sarah, as she must be present at the top of the tower so that the winning team can enter Nirvana. Originally written by novelist Yugo Dai, Satoshi Tadashi would eventually adapt and finish the story following Godai's failing health, requiring her to leave the project. What makes Digital Devil Saga unique compared to every other game in the franchise is the immense focus on story and cinematic storytelling, the game's focus on Hinduism, and the lack of any form of demon recruitment in favor of a set group of characters who can shift between demon and human. Personally, I feel like the Digital Devil Saga series is the most underrated within the Western fanbase, despite the fact that it's one of the more popular series in the West. I implore you, if you are interested at all by what you see and hear, play these games. The story is great, the music is some of Shoji Meguro's best work, and it's such an interesting piece of Atlas history. There really aren't any other games like it within Atlas's catalog. They originally released on the PS2 back in 2004 and 2005, but they were later made available on the PS3 via the PlayStation Store. Please, go play them. Finally, we're brought to the most recent series within the franchise, and the last main pillar within the Western fanbase, as well as the one that got me into it all. Devil Survivor. Starting in 2009 with the release of Megami Ibon Roku Devil Survivor for the Nintendo DS, this series would go on to have two main games, an enhanced re-release of both entries to the Nintendo 3DS, a manga adaptation of both games, and an anime adaptation of the second entry. Devil Survivor acts as Atlas's return to tactical RPGs, but this time offering a much more unique take. Designed to appeal to newcomers of the genre, the game takes the traditional chess-like system of TRPGs and turns attacking into a quick round of the press turn combat system the franchise has become known for. Devil Survivor also replaces demon negotiation with an auction system. Instead of conversing with demons and convincing them to join your side, Demons actually put contracts up for sale, allowing you to place bids and battle others for it. The games also draw from the success of the Persona series as well, adding an in-game clock that will move forward depending on the actions you take. Depending on your choices, you'll end up unlocking one of a number of endings based around the game's characters. Devil Survivor is often considered to be the best of both worlds. It's able to bring together the dark, philosophical themes of mainline Shin Megami Tensei games, as well as the more light-hearted, character-focused plot of Persona. However, how much it takes depends on the game. Devil Survivor 1 and its enhanced re-release, Devil Survivor Overclocked, lean more towards mainline, forcing the characters to survive out on the streets while society collapses and people start fighting each other with demons. It creates a more oppressive and dour atmosphere, with each character subplot tying directly into the events of the game. Meanwhile, Devil Survivor 2 and its enhanced re-release Devil Survivor 2 Record Breaker lean more towards Persona in a number of ways. Not long into the game, the main cast are brought into a secure bunker after being recruited by the government. Because you're out there doing missions to save the world and have a safe place to return to, the moment-to-moment -moment tone is much more lighthearted compared to the first game. While still dealing with the world-ending situation, it's not until the latter half of the game do things start to feel as serious as they did in the first. They also implement the fate system, which can easily be described as social links but not. If you're going to play either of these games, play the 3DS versions. Not only do they fix a lot of the problems with the original releases, but they include full voice acting and add a bunch of content. Record Breaker adds in a brand new campaign that is so large, it's almost as long as the original. So there we go. That is every series within this big ol' franchise. Okay, but you still haven't answered the initial question. What games are and aren't SMT? And for that matter, why is this a confusing topic in the first place? Well, for your second question, you can blame Atlas Yusawest for that. Who? It's me! Ah! Atlus Jusa West, ah. the Western division of Atlus that's just trying to make some money, man. As for the question that started it all, I'm gonna bring back the opening gag from my original video. Hey there, 
Series. Juju just finished Persona 3, 4, and or 5. You want to see what else the Shin Megami Tensei Series has to offer? But when you go and ask people what to play next, they tell you to play a real Shin Megami, Shin Megami Tensei, Tensei game. game like Nocturne. But then you're confused by what they mean because Persona 3 and Persona 4 both say Shin Megami Tensei right on the box? Are these people just elitist assholes? So you remember how I said in the West it's called Shin Megami Tensei, while in Japan it's simply called Megami Tensei? The reason for this is the fact that the original Megami Tensei games never released in the West by the time Nocturne did. Once they started bringing over Megami Tensei games like Digital Devil Saga and Persona 3, Atlas USA wanted to make it clear that these games were related to Nocturne. Because the franchise is a much more famous entity in Japan, the connection doesn't need to be as blatant. But in North America and Europe? They slap that name on every single Megaten game in the hopes of increasing their sales and giving them more of a fighting chance. Tell me, if you were walking around GameStop in 2006 and saw Raido Kuzunoha vs the Soulless Army for the first time ever on the shelf, would you rather buy this game that kinda looks like that one RPG for the PS2 you heard was really good? Or would you rather buy what seemed to be a new entry in a series you had heard time and time again was great? And the reason they chose the Shin Megami Tensei name over Megami Tensei should be obvious. On the other hand, as Persona started to branch away from the rest of the series and grow in popularity, many people wanted to try out the other games with the name Shin Megami Tensei on it, only to find that they were drastically different from the dating sim dungeon crawling hybrid they fell in love with. Out of both annoyance at Persona fans that complained about the rest of the franchise not being like the games they loved, and jealousy of the Persona series utterly stealing the attention of both audiences and Atlas away from the games they loved, the divide in the franchise was born and elitism was bred. It was both branding and elitism that created all of this. And sadly, I can't tell you that there's a simple answer. Because in a way, there are multiple correct answers, and it all depends on the context. In the context of Japan, Shin Megami Tensei is simply the series that succeeded Megami Tensei. Devil Summoner and Devil Children are the only games that aren't mainline to have the Shin Megami Tensei moniker on it, and even then it was only present with the original Devil Summoner. Both Persona 1 and Devil Survivor 1 were branded as Megami Ippon Roku games, which was a title meant to signify the game's status as a spin-off of the Megami Tensei series. But they were the only games to be called that. Devil Children and Digital Devil Saga did not have it, nor did the enhanced re-releases of Persona 1 on the PSP and Devil Survivor 1 on the 3DS. In the context of the West, Shin Megami Tensei can be talking about two things, the mainline games or the franchise as a whole. And it gets even more confusing when you bring in how the original release of Persona 1 and Last Bible 1 were localized under the Revelations branding, Jack Bros and Persona 2 Eternal Punishment weren't branded as anything but themselves, and the fact that every Persona game since Persona 4 Golden has dropped the Shin Megami Tensei title. Hell, even Atlas Japan themselves can make it confusing on their yearly earnings reports where they list Megami Tensei and Persona as two separate franchises. So now we return to the title of this video. What exactly is a Shin Megami Tensei game? And what isn't? The answer? So oh, fuck if I know, look at the context of the conversation. This franchise is so goddamn confusing, I don't blame anyone for thinking it's one way or the other. Ooh, hey guys, thank you for watching the video. <laughs> I just finished editing it. This is about maybe two, two and a half week long process outside of uh, writing the script and everything. Ugh, I'm tired. Anyway, I got a few questions that were left on my original what is and isn't SMT video that I wanted to answer, but I couldn't really work them into the script in a way that felt right to me. So I decided I'm just going to answer them here at the end. Uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to thank you for watching again, and I wanted to tell you to subscribe and hit the bell for more. I got some more SMT content planned leading up to SMT 5's release, so make sure to stick around for that. Uh, some collabs and some other stuff. I also got some non-Atlas content that I have out and I'll be doing alongside all of this. I have a series called Is A Good Game, which is, uh, 
essentially where all of the non-Atlas stuff tends to go. Um, but those are much quicker and easier to kind of throw out there. They're like a review, impressions, comedy type videos. Uh, they're not terribly long to make, but yeah, I like to do them alongside everything else. So hey, you get some SMT and then you can get some Xenoblade or some Paper Mario on the side. Also check out my video on the train wreck that was the Atlas Online Store and how it could be improved if slash when it returns, or my review analysis on Catherine Full Body if you need some more of a 24 year old white dude talking about this weird Japanese game developer in your life. Also, also thank you to my buddy LaRue for fact checking my script as well as his little cameo during the Devil Children section, my buddy Owen for acting as a stand in for you guys, and for the game show for continuing to play Atlas USA West. He, I initially intended it to be Atlas USA West, but he said it USA West the one time, and I just. I can't go back after that. It's too good. What about Catherine and Machin X? They're not considered Mega Ten games, despite having a lot of the same people working on them, though they can be considered honorary entries because of it. Catherine actually draws quite a bit from Mainline SMT, considering it has its own version of the alignment system and multiple endings based on moral choices made throughout, so... Eh, ki ki kinda? Kinda? I doubt Atlas even has an official stance on all of this. Yeah, honestly, I'm inclined to agree. I don't think they were thinking about any of this as they were making them. The protagonist of SMT If is in Persona, so that makes it SMT. Uh, I don't think a cameo is enough to declare that. What about games like Tokyo Mirage Sessions and DX2 Liberation? So DX2 is a side game within Mainline, but Tokyo Mirage Sessions is in this weird gray area. It started off being more of a traditional crossover spin-off type thing before evolving into a game that simply just takes inspiration from Fire Emblem and SMT. Its Japanese name, Geni Ibonroku Sharp Fe, is an evolution of Megami Ibonroku, so I feel like if it got a sequel, you could say it's its own series? What about Project Re Fantasy? While it is made by Hashino and his crew, they have stated they wanted to make a game that is nothing like Atlas has made before. They explicitly said they didn't want it to have anything to do with Persona or Shin Megami Tensei, so outside of a Jack Frost, Teddy, Koromaru, or Morgana cameo, I don't expect any real connection between it and Mega Ten. Every game with Jack Frost in it is Shimigami Tensei. Know what? You're right. Snowboard Kids is my favorite SMT game. Come on.